You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Srivasa Prakash. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, we've got Kevin Moore, who is also known as the Macro Tourist. He publishes a a newsletter known as, well, the uh, the Macro Tourist. You can find him on Twitter at Kevin Moore, um, K-E-V-I-N-M-U-I-R. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure, Sri. I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. So Kevin, could you share a little bit about your background, how you got into the business and your journey to where you are today, especially, you know, you've got a very interesting background working you know, on the desk at RBC. So, yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll go, I'll, I'll go actually even before RBC. Uh, I actually was going to school at University of Toronto here in Toronto. And uh, it was in the early 90s and the, the market was uh, taking off and there was a lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of business to be done. And I actually got a job part-time at night at Bank of Montreal Investor Line, which was a discount stock brokerage division. And I worked at night while I was going to school. And then next thing I know, it got busier and busier. And they kept asking me to do hours. And so I said, sure, I'll do it. And I was next thing I knew, I was working 12-hour days. And I was making all sorts of money. And I was going to school. Then I rearranged it. So I go to school at night. And before I knew it, I was the manager of the desk. And I said to myself, this isn't what I want. Like, I didn't want to be a, a discount stock brokerage manager. I always wanted to be a trader. So I... Um, I actually quit and I went to work in the pits in Chicago. So I took off and I went to the Chicago pits because I'd read all these terrific books about how great it was in Chicago. And I didn't like that. And so I came back actually pretty quickly and I was lucky enough to get a job at RBC Dominion Securities in the early nineties on the institutional equity desk. And as my boss likes to tell me, there was guys that were better at computers. There was guys that were better at trading, but I was the right mix of both. And so I was lucky enough to get a job there uh, at a young age, even before I'd finished my degree. And, uh, you know, I spent the next, uh, from the early 90s all the way to 2000 there, where I was eventually the uh, kind of the head uh, risk taker for the equity derivative book. Wow, that's awesome. So, you know, what, what made you sort of quit the uh, pits at Chicago? So, uh, because uh, that's sort of, you know, where all the big names, like, you know, Paul so Peter the, Jones and yeah. Yeah. So the pits are very, the physical and it was, it was more, it was going to be a long time before I was going to be able to actually be trading. Usually you go down there and you clerk and things like that. And I just realized that it w- just wasn't for me. It wasn't something that I wanted to be, you know, fighting. And a lot of times they get guys that are ex football players because they're, you know, t- you know being tall helps. Mm-hmm. something I'm not. <laughs> so it was just, it was just kind of my realization that that wasn't really what I was, was meant to do. I was, you know, probably more on the kind of in, not intellectual side, but more kind of my, my, my mind was probably better equipped at figuring out how to do trades than my, than my body. So I was better off coming and working with computers. Got it. So when you were at the prop desk at RBC, what did you learn there? What were the major lessons that, you know, you learned about markets? So I think I've read the story about Stanley Druckenmiller getting a job and someone hired him because they wanted somebody that was young enough to not know any better and was just going to charge into it. I think I got it right. I think it was Stanley Druckenmiller. It might be someone else, Mm -hmm. but there's a story about There's a certain brashness that occurs when you're young and you're just, you don't know any better. And so there was, there was, it was also, it coincided with a time in the markets when we were becoming computerized. And so I, it was really, I was really fortunate because the older fellows that were trading weren't as good at computers. They didn't know how to do computers. So we were doing all sorts of things that we had never um, done before in terms of program trading. And we, we actually created the first program that did what's called interlisted arbitrage, where it buys the stock in New York and sells it in Toronto automatically. I still remember my, one of my kind of the chief risk officer coming and saying to me, what are you doing? Like, cause I had this big Unix box, Unix, like the sun microsystem box. And we had this big box and 
we were programming it up and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're writing this program to do this arbitrage. And he said, why you do that? I already have 13 guys doing that. And I said, well, because the computer's going to do it better. And it ended up being, a, you know, an unbelievably great time to be in the markets. It was a terrific firm in that they offered young kids the ability if you could make money that they would let you take risk and do well. Uh, I made my share of mistakes, but on the whole, it was just kind of, it, my youth almost was better for me because I was just go for it. Like, and, and that was the kind of environment that we were in. Um, in terms of like, what would I have learned? I, I guess one of the things that I learned best was, it, it's just probably not a skill that I use as much today, but I was lucky enough to be around some traders that had been in the business for a long, long time. And they understood how to make trade. And so what does that mean? That means like if you're on the sell side, meaning you're a broker, um, people think that it's just a question of you sit around, you wait for the call, the call comes in and the client tells you to go buy, you know, 100,000 Bell Canada. And sometimes it is, sometimes it is that easy. But a lot of times it's not. A lot of times there's, there's a skill and, a, you know, a technique to making trade. And I'll, and I'll tell you one quick story that I, I love to talk about in terms of understanding what it took to make trade. Back then, stocks traded in eights. Like instead of pennies, they were traded in eights. So there was a big stock that was coming out and it was a new issue. And it came out at, let's say, $8. And, or we'll say $9 because it's easier. So it comes out at $9. And everybody is, you know, getting on the bid at $9 and everyone's offering it at nine and an eighth. And so as an institutional client or a broker, what we did was we would say, okay, we'll buy it at nine and we'll sell it at nine and an eighth if a client came and wanted a market. Well, my big boss, I remember sitting there watching him, this older gentleman, and he sat there and he looked at the quote and it was nine bid at nine and an eighth offered. And he said to his assistant beside him, he says, Okay, get me on the offering nine and an eighth for half a million. So he got, so he put an order to sell half a million and nine and an eighth. And then he says, sell 250 at nine. So the guy sells 250 at nine dollars. Watches the market, he watches the tape, listens, does some more things. Then he says, okay, sell another 500 at nine. So he sells 500 at nine. Now all of a sudden, instead of the market being nine dollars bid at nine and an eighth, it's all of a sudden eight and seven eighths at nine dollars offered. Okay. So now everyone is saying, I'll buy it at eight and seven eighths or I'll you know, sell it at nine. But what does he do? He goes out and he says to the institutional salespeople around him, he says, I'll pay the offering for a million shares. And so what he did by doing that is he changed the quote and then he made it look like he was willing to pay an offering and give a client a better price to, you know, to sell it at $9. And then it ended up being that you know, someone sold us a million and then we find out, we talk to them and we find out he's got more to do and, and the trade kind of, got created from there. So I was lucky enough to be around some really, really shrewd traders like the, that taught me little tricks like that, that kind of made me understand how the game was played. Got it. Well, though, what, what other kinds of strategies did you implement? So, you know, you talked sort of about, you know, block trading, and then you talked about, you know, inter exchange arbitrage. So yep. any, any other well, strategies that you so implemented? When I was there, I was the index trader. So I was the fellow that was in charge of um, handling what is now XIUs, but back then there was TIPS and HIPS, which is the Toronto 35 and the Toronto 100. Mm -hmm. It eventually became the Toronto XIU, which is the 60. And so I was kind of like the index trader and I would be on the phone all day with the, the fellow in the pits and we would be doing program trading. We would be doing bidding on blocks against all of our clients. You know, when they wanted liquidity, they would come and they would ask us for bids on you know, give me a bid on a million of this or an offering on, you know, two million of this. And then we also did all the rebalances. So we did all those things um, along the way. We did swaps and some other derivatives, and then we had a big option book. So it was basically just a lot of kind of typical equity derivative type transactions that we did. Got it. And, you know, how are markets different than, than today? Were there any strategies that you were able to implement then that wouldn't work now, you know, especially after 2008 when basically there are no more prop desk at banks? Yeah, so, well, first of all, like the interlisted arbitrage, we did that for a long time. And so I didn't finish my story in terms of what my career is. I left in 2000. Mm -hmm. um, 
my daughter was actually born with a heart defect and it was kind of my moment where I decided what's important. And I said, you know what, I've had it with the bank. I'm going to go work for myself and I can always go get a job if I want to. And as a joke, I said, one year turned into two, which turned into five, which turned into 20. So for the past 20 years, I've basically been trading my own account. Um, for a little while, I worked with another fellow, like we're actually not for a little while, for 15 of those years, I worked with another fellow and we did the interlisted arbitrage for the first five years after I left the bank. Eventually HFT came along, high frequency trading, and that eliminated that. So what it, in essence occurred was a shrinking of spreads in terms of those types of arbitrages. And so it all sped up and it ended up being that we couldn't compete anymore. You had guys that were co-locating on exchanges and it ended up, ended up being games of milliseconds instead of just, you know, other things. So that's the, one of the changes. The other thing that's really though, like when I'm thinking about trying to explain how the world has changed since my days on the bank, when I was there, we had a huge advantage in that we were close to the action. We knew we had all the feeds. We knew what was going on. And most people didn't like, you know, by the time I was just a joke, by the time the dentists are buying it, you want to be selling it to the dentist. Well, the dentists today have Twitter, they have the, just as good as systems and the world has completely changed in terms of the leveling of the playing field. And I would argue that even in some ways, it's probably easier to make money as an individual than it is as um, at a bank or running a portfolio manager. If you think about like when you're a portfolio manager and you're trading, you're trading big blocks and the cost to get in and out is huge, meaning that you're moving markets. Mm -hmm. When we go out, let's say we're just trading for ourselves and we buy, you know, even if we're a big trader and we're, you know, tossing around, you know, five, 10,000 of, you know, of 40 or, you know, hundred dollar stock, you're still not moving it that much but you added zero or two to those orders and you'd be shocked at how hard it is to execute and what the cost is. And then the other thing is the costs. It used to be that it was actually relatively expensive to trade. Now, you know, like with the advent of Robin Hood and, and all these things, it's basically free. And so I think that the, the, the leveling of the playing field between the retail and the institutional trader has become enormous. And then the one thing that I think that people don't realize that as an individual trader that they have as an advantage over a portfolio manager or institutional trader is that they're able to say, no, I don't want to play. Like, I don't need to be in the market. And so there's a huge advantage in that there's less pressure to maintain a benchmark. So, you know, let's just take now, for example, it could be the stocks are going to go higher. But if you're sitting there as a portfolio manager and you're not fully invested and all your peers are fully invested, you have this, like, it's, it's almost a short position. And, it, and it's almost like these guys are suffering and then they end up having to, you know, cover it and, and get long. Whereas you as an individual investor can go, listen, you know, maybe the S&P goes up another 20%. So be it. I don't need, I don't have a benchmark I'm trying to beat. I can just go for an absolute return. So the ability to sit things out is, is hugely, hugely missed in terms of, or, or not as well understood by individual investors. And that therein lies their true advantage over the institutional money. Got it, got it. So, you know, at the start, you also said that, you know, you, you wanted to be a trader. You do not want to be sort of a discount broker. You also did not want to be a clerk. You wanted to be a trader. So, you know, what was it that made you, you know, want to become a trader? And secondly, if you were starting out, you know, let's say you were me, you were 17 and, you know, you wanted to become a trader. How would you go about, you know, pursuing a career as a trader today? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so I was lucky enough, my father was actually the research director at a, at, a, at a brokerage firm. I grew up in Winnipeg and he was the research director. So I was lucky enough to um, sit around at the, the kitchen table and talk stocks and, and be exposed to it at a young age. Having said that, I was always, I loved playing games. And he always, my father laughs and he says that even from the moment I was little, like I would bring games up and I'd want to play. So I never... Um, 
had any doubt what I wanted to be. Like there was a tiny little point where I thought I wanted to be corporate finance because there was a time in the eighties when everyone wanted to be an investment banker. But I very quickly, I read Market Wizards and then I was like, there's no way I want to do anything except this. And that was always, that was my book to do. Um, and so, so if I was to give advice to people today, and actually the advice I do give to people is that like in my day, I got my job because I was good at computers. And being good at computers back then was like knowing Excel. Like, in, like and I'm, I'm not even kidding. It was, I was better than knowing Excel, but it wasn't much better. And nowadays everyone knows Excel, so there's no, nothing there. But the one thing is that older people are less likely to go and immerse themselves in new technology. And there's a whole bunch of new technology out there, meaning Python, R, or you know anything like that, that I would tell people, if you're a young person, you should be going and you should be learning those things because you really don't have much to offer except for your hard work, your enthusiasm, and the fact that you'll do it for a little bit less than an old guy. But the one thing that you're better at, your, your advantage, your inherent advantage, is your ability to go learn those things and then to have those skills. So you need to work on trying to find a way to add value to a desk or add value to a portfolio manager or add value on a, you know, um, uh, as an analyst, whatever it is. And a lot of times there's tons and tons of data out there and it's hard to shift through and figure out what it is, right? Like sift through it and figure out, you know, what it's saying. Mm -hmm. And your ability to be able to take that data and present it and can compute it and do things and stuff like that is hugely important. You don't need to be like a, a Waterloo math kid. Like, you know, it doesn't hurt to be those things. But the reality is that those guys are often working in actual full-time computer, computer like jobs, right? Yeah. But a trader, just because you're a trader doesn't mean that you shouldn't have the skills and you should be able to talk to those guys as well. That's the other thing that people don't realize is that the ability to talk to a you know, computer programmer in their own language is really helpful, meaning that if you can understand like what the issues are, get halfway. I'll tell you a story. I went to um, I went to New York City, and when I'm in another city, I always kind of just like at the end of whatever I'm doing, I always say, "Does anyone want to grab a beer?" So I just tweeted it out, and a bunch of a bunch of people came, uh, and they ended up being younger because you know it was last minute, and so you get young guys. And I was fascinated because I was talking to one of them, and we were going through their careers and what they were doing and stuff. And sure, there was one guy that was like an MIT physics guy and he was working at like Citadel or Susquehanna doing like ball derivatives. And like, it was like that, yeah, he was a real propeller head. But there was another guy there that was like, you know, a finance major and he'd gotten a job at a hedge fund. And I started asking him about it. And he says, well, I do a lot of Python programming. And I said, well, oh, that's interesting. Why were you, why do you do that? And he said, well, truth be told, you know, we ran into a little bit of a, a rough patch and we couldn't afford any programmers or whatever. And I realized someone had to do this. So I picked it up and I started doing it. And for him, he figured out a way to make himself valuable so he wouldn't get canned and things like that. And, and he ended up being, you know, like a finance major that's a good little programmer now. So I would say to anyone that's young, that's interested in trying to get a job is to go do something that you can actually compete with old, the older people and do that. And then the next advice I give is read, 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 uh, learn as much as you can and show your passion towards the markets. Because you know that's really ultimately what's gonna differentiate. Like for, Sri, Sri, for you, for example, like doing this podcast, it's terrific. Like people are gonna be like, he must yeah. be passionate about it. He's doing this 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 show and stuff like that figure out a way to differentiate yourself somehow and show people that you really are you know passionate about the markets got it got it that's great advice and you know uh, and you know when you talk about a career you know you sort of make the shift from being a prop trader on a desk to being you know a full-time you know retail you know trader who trades you know by himself so uh, what was that shift like you know how was the shift and you know what were the challenges that you faced when you made that shift that's a great question. Um, so I wasn't quite like a like a retail trader. Like I still, um, we had direct lines to the brokers, and we were using even when I went and traded for myself. I was uh, 
we had Unix boxes and we were doing stuff. So I was probably a little more different than a typical retail trader that just, you know, goes out and opens an account. But having said that, there were some shifts. And I'll tell you, my always people always ask me, what were the two things that I miss? And the one thing that I uh, immediately missed was the camaraderie of a trading desk. And it's fun. Like people are betting and they're having fun and they're ribbing each other. And it's, it's kind of like being in a like a hockey room, locker room, like, you know, uh, and, and it was a lot of fun. Like there's no doubt about it. So I missed, I missed that kind of social atmosphere of the trading desk. And then the next thing that I missed is when I was at the bank, uh, I eventually became such that I was trading big size. Like, you know, I would go and our, our ability to access capital was huge. You know, it was a bank and we were, we, we were successful. So we were able to do it. So I was tossing around some big numbers. And then when I went on my own, people would phone me up and say, you know, we're going up on a million of this print, like meaning that they're doing a block trade. And they wanted to know if I wanted to buy any, because that's like, you know, that's how it works on block trades. They ask you, you know, we're open on quarter million. Do you want any? And I would kind of sheepishly say, well, I'll take 10, but like, I understand if you don't want to write up the ticket. Cause like, like 10, you're not helping. Cause the reality is that like, you know, you're just getting in the way on with a 10 number. So I definitely missed trading size. Like that was always something I miss. I miss being the guy that set the price. Like when, when you're the person that's buying 10 or 20 or even 50, you're not setting any price. But if you're the guy that's buying 250 or 500, you know, you could be the person that's, that's making the price. So I miss that. Got it. And, uh, you know, were there, uh, were there any sort of shifts from strategy, you know, uh, when you were a prop trader versus when you, uh, you know, when you made the shift to trade by yourself or has your strategy overall stayed the same? So my strategy um, is probably the hardest to explain in that <laughs> I don't have one. And, you know, it's kind of like my writing for those who know my letter, I will talk about foreign exchange, I will talk about convertible arbitrage, I will talk about, um, you know, value stocks, then I will go talk about euro dollar trades. The reality is that over my kind of 20 years, um, I have traded numerous, numerous things. And that's probably my probably my, my edge is the ability to understand the various different tarp types of trading and to adapt. One of the things that, one of the reasons I left the bank was I was frustrated because they had slotted me in this position as the index trader. And although I loved index trading, I wanted to do more. I would come up with an idea that I'd go do it. And then they'd be like, you can't trade that. And I'd be like, okay, whatever. And then they'd tell me, and they were telling me what I can't trade. They're telling me all I can't trade. You can't trade this, you can't trade that. And it seemed to be that every time I turned around, they were telling me I couldn't trade something. And so on my own, people have always said like, like, how do you make your money? So I don't know how I'm gonna make my money. Like even now, like, I don't know how I'm gonna make my money next year. Like I can tell you how I made my money last year. I can tell you how I made my money the year before, but the reality is that the strategy has been completely different. There's been times that there's like, you know, it's been convertible arbitrage has made me money. There's times that FX has made me a lot of money. I'll give you a perfect example of kind of like how, um, my ability to trade different things has helped me. In the first time oil crashed, not this last time when I went to negative, but the first time oil crashed, when the Saudis came in and decided to pump, 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 and oil went from like 80 bucks to 15 or something. I can't remember what the numbers were. It doesn't seem so bad now because it went negative this last time, but it, at the time it was brutal. And I remember getting bullish uh, towards the bottom. I was probably early because I'm always early, but. Uh, I remember getting bullish and I was going to buy some oil contracts, some futures. And I went to go and buy, look at them. And the curve was trading so steep, meaning that the front end was trading like 15, but like two months out was trading at 20 or 25 or something. So meaning that I would have had to be, my timing would have had to be perfect. And there's huge carry in terms of being long this thing. So I said, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Like, oh, that's going to be like, that's too hard a game. I don't want to do that. So then I looked at the equities and the equities Unfortunately, what had happened was they'd gotten into so much trouble because the price of the stocks, the price of the commodity had come down so much 
these companies were on the verge of like not being able to, you know, keep going as a going concern. And so the equities though were trading like call options, meaning that the capital structure had become impaired with all the bonds that they had. And so the, the bonds were trading at like 50 cents on the dollar, but the equities were trading like call options on that portion, right? Of, of assuming that the bonds would do it. So they were wildly expensive. And so I said to myself, well, listen, you know what? If the bonds are trading 50 cents on the dollar and I'm bullish on, the, on these things, chances are a lot of these are going to be money good. And so I started learning about the bonds and I started to go look at the different names. And I ended up buying, like, I spent, you know, weeks trying to buy all these bonds because like corporate bonds don't trade very well, especially for a retail trader like me. I can't go and, you know, like bid on when someone comes and gets, you know, sells half a million of a block. I got to pick away at it. It's hard for me to get. But so what I did though, was I just kind of created this portfolio of these things. And my thinking was, you know, I was buying these bonds at 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar. And I thought to myself, well, if worse comes to worse and these companies don't make it, what's going to happen is these bonds are going to get restructured and they're going to be the next part of the equity, meaning mm -hmm. that they're going to go and do it. And they'll be, they'll be kind of the portion that I want anyways. And if I'm willing to be long the equity, then I might as well own the bonds. So long and short of it is that year was, was a great year because I bought these bonds, you know, like, as I say, 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar. By the end of the year, a lot of them were trading money good. And what they were doing is they were selling equity and buying back their bonds because it made more sense to go issue equity that was relatively expensive to buy back the bonds on the open market at you know, 60, 70, 80 cents on the dollar and they're still pocketing the difference. So that would be the kind of example of a trade that a lot of other, you know, if you're an equity person, you would only have bought the equity. If you're a futures person, you'd only buy the futures. If you're a bond person, you might've bought the, the same thing as me, but the reality is that you probably were already long the bonds. But as me, as kind of a generalist, I was able to go do what I viewed as the most kind of risk adjusted best trade. And, you know, are there ever times that you get involved in a market that, you know, you don't know too much about and that sort of costs you money or? Oh, yeah, listen, <laughs> like, yeah, for sure. it's not like I don't make mistakes. As like my tagline says, um, my, my tagline is all I bring to the party is 25 years of mistakes. <laughs> yep. And if you if you meet someone in trading that tries to tell you they don't make mistakes and they don't do things like that, you should ignore them because the reality is that you're making mistakes all the time. That's how you learn. Hopefully you're making new ones. The, the real mistakes are when you make them twice. Uh, yeah, there's all sorts of things. Like I'll give you an example. Although I was an option trader and understood option trading, I remember I got involved with a long dated uh, option and uh, warrant, it was a warrant. And I, I knew the theory behind that interest rates and dividends you know, affect the option pricing, okay? So I knew it, like I understood it, I just knew it. But until you go, if you're used to trading three month options or six month options, those, you know, uh, those sensitivities are very minor. You go and you trade a five year warrant and they change the dividend, it's all of a sudden it's like, holy shit. Like you just like, you're, I was just flabbergasted how much money I lost. And it was kind of frustrating because like, I was like, I knew it. I knew the theory, as I told you, I knew instantly why it occurred, but I didn't understand how sensitive it was to that. And those are the kind of things that, you know, until you do it and, and actually experience it, you might not figure it out on your own. And like, even knowing it doesn't mean that you're not going to make that mistake. So are there, are there mistakes that I made? Yes. And I continue to make them and I'm sure I'll make some new ones. <laughs> Got it. So, you know, you sort of, uh, you know, you saw in your interview with Aaron Fifield on chat with trading, you know, you said that you've done everything from, say, trading S&P futures to Bitcoin mining. So how do you actually go about assessing sort of this vast, you know, swath of opportunity and, you know, so many markets? How, how do you go about actually trying to find opportunity? That's a great question. So um, I guess that one of the things is I'm always curious and I'm always reading things and trying to learn. And I figure that if I just keep learning, I'll figure it out. And like one of the things that interests me right now is the uh, idea about dealer positioning in options markets being the tail that wag the dog. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, you know, if there's, a, if there's a dealer positioning that's short gamma, uh, then that will affect the actual underlying. 
And it was something I just kind of stumbled upon. And I was like, hey, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. And I just went about learning about it. And, and once you start to learn about it, you'll then all of a sudden something will click and you'll say, okay, I understand this. I now can figure out and I can use it in my trading in this way. So I just always stay curious. I always love learning about trading. I love talking about markets. I just, I love it when people, you know, there's nothing I uh, appreciate more than someone telling me like a great angle, like something that nobody else has thought about, like a great trade. And, and it just, and it, it's fascinating. Like even, even after the fact, I still love learning because I love to understand why they did it and to try to, you know, apply those things to mine. Like for example, Bill Ackman, when he got bearish, when he got worried about COVID and he got bearish on the markets, he went and did a big CDS position and a credit default swap. And the interesting thing about this story is when you go learn it and read about it, a lot of people would have gone and they would have bought the most risky credit. They would have bought insurance on the most risky credit. And Bill Ackman actually said, no, I'm better off buying more, using more leverage and buying a cheaper insurance on the highest rated credit because I think that there's going to be so much problems in the system. And it's little things like that, 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 that those types of understanding how the market works and little tricks that you have to always be on the lookout for and you always have to start to think about it and you have to kind of imagine yourself in that situation and then think about how I'm going to do that and I'm going to use those theories going forward. Got it. Got it. And so, you know, today, like in these current markets, where do you see opportunity? Uh, okay, so for the longest time, I've been like a, uh, an inflation bull. And people always say, well, why are you an inflation bull? And I always kind of say, well, I, when I look through history, I can tell you lots of countries who've collapsed because of inflation. I've yet to meet one that's collapsed because of deflation. And I think it's complicated why, but I think that people mistakenly assume that we cannot create inflation. And it has to do with monetary versus fiscal policy. And I've been arguing for a while that, that if we have the political will, we can always create inflation. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened with COVID is it's showed that this is the case. So now when you ask about the opportunities going forward in, this, in the markets, I'm actually, one of the things I'm most worried about is the risks going forward in the market. And when you hear me say that, I think a lot of people will say, oh, he's all worried about the stock market. The stock market's up a long way. It must be like he's going to be bearish on the stock market. Although I do understand how we are overextended on the stock market basis and there's lots of risks there, that's not really what keeps me up at night. What really keeps me up at night is the fixed income market. And if you think about the fixed income market, you know, what is the worst uh, kind of outcome for a fixed income investor? It's inflation, or sorry, for sovereign in risk, uh, inflate, um, fixed income investor, it's inflation. Because let's face it, the US government is never gonna go and, you know, uh, renege or, or default on their, the things. But Canada's not gonna default, nobody's gonna default. What they're gonna do is actually just create the money out of thin air and they're gonna you know, create inflation. It's obviously much more complicated than that. And it's like a whole rabbit hole that we go down there. But I just look at this and I think to myself, we've had 40 years of the, of the bond markets going down in terms of yield, up in terms of price. And it's lulled people into a false belief that bonds are uh, safe and bonds can't hurt you. And it's been all the worse because bonds have been negatively correlated to stocks, meaning that when your stock market got into all sorts of trouble, bonds would generally be bid. And so what this has enabled people to do is you know, do something called risk parity where they lever up the bond portion of the portfolio and they mix it with stocks and it ends up being just a terrific strategy or it has been a terrific strategy. And you know, the world's richest hedge fund manager is a guy named Ray Dalio. And at Bridgewater, he made his fortune, you know, doing this strategy. And even, you know, the typical investment advisor, you know, with his clients, he's, he's doing that as well. He's putting 60, the, the traditional, what they call 60, 40, you put 60% in equities and you put 40% in bonds and, you know, it becomes uh, this, this safe 
it mutes down the volatility and then you, and then you get the yield. Well, the trouble is there's no more yield. And not only that, I think that the bonds, whereas in the past they've been a ballast to your portfolio, I think they're gonna become the anchor that, that sinks them. And so when I think about kind of risks, I think there's all sorts of risks that we wake up and inflation is ripping and that bonds end up being way, way higher in terms of yield. And, you know, we, I'm telling you them as risks, but me as a proprietary trader, I'm also using that as, uh, you know, an opportunity. So for me, I actually, my favorite trade that I don't even think about that I've been long forever and I, you can go look and Google me. I've like, I've written about this and people are probably sick of hearing about it, but it's the, what's called the break-even trade. And the break-even trade is basically you own tips. Tips are treasury inflation protected securities. They basically pay an interest rate plus inflation. Nowadays, the interest rate's actually negative because you, you know, that's how it works. But anyways, it's a, that's what's called a negative real yield. So what I do is I buy those tips and I short the nominal treasury bond of an equal duration. And I isolate what's called the inflation expectations. And so I'm long those inflation expectations. And that is by far and away my favorite trade. Uh, I've been long it. I was long it before COVID. And I, I managed to get through. I held on through all COVID. And now they've kind of come screaming back. But I think that by the end of the day, what, before this cycle is all through, pension funds will be reaching for tips like we've never seen before because they'll be needing some sort of protection against inflation. And like, you know, 30 year break evens are trading at 230 or something. Right. I think they're going to trade four or 5%. And that's where that, like, it'll be something like that. And the okay. move will be astronomical. So, that, so the long short of it is like my main number one trade is to be short fixed income and short the long end of the curve. And so with my theory, there's all sorts of kind of other complicated trades that you can do. You can do something called the steepener, which is basically you go long the front end of the curve, like long, like a two year note and you short like a 10 or a 30 year note. So you can do things like that. I also like trading um, Euro dollar futures and you can go and you can start, you know, trading options mm -hmm. on Euro dollar futures. It's called mid curve options. So recently I've become more of a fixed income trader than I probably would have ever cared to admit. But uh, I do think that that's probably gonna be the, you know, the most uh, attractive opportunity going forward. The other thing is that I, I will say one last thing in terms of other opportunities. I, I've had this theory that I've called a series of rolling bubbles. And I've noticed this and it seems to be accelerating. Meaning that in the old days we'd have a bubble on, you know, let's just say in the 2000s, we had a bubble in technology. And it would be kind of, yes, there was some like bubbles within the bubbles, but on the whole, it was just bubble in technology. But ever since kind of the great financial crisis, I've noticed that the bubbles have become kind of quicker. They've become more intense. And it's almost like the money goes from a hot spot to a hot spot to a hot spot. And it's crazy. Like, Let's just go and think about coming out of the COVID. When we first came out of COVID, everyone wanted to own Peloton, Zoom, and whatever. It was all these kind of like, you know, stay-at-home stocks. Then it became a SPAC trade, right? Like it was all these new SPACs, all these new fancy stocks and things like that. Then it became, and then those have come off. Now it's become, you know, Bitcoin's in there. But what you get is these kind of moves. And now we're actually having lumber, lumber's taken off, grains have come off like this. And I think that we're going to have more and more of what I call these rolling bubbles. And I think that the mistake will be to assume that something's gone too far. Uh, and as you can just see from like anyone who assumed like GameStop went too far or, um, you know, lumber has gone too far. Don't be very careful fading those things. In the old days, you could fade those things. You, you don't want to fade those things. In the end of the day, the reason you don't want to fade those things is because they're pushing way more money into the system. Um, and everyone's going to talk about quantitative easing. I don't believe it's quantitative easing that's the real, pro the real driver of that. I actually think it's fiscal policy. But regardless of what, what's causing it, there are, there are more and more of these rolling bubbles. And so when I think about it, I'm thinking that there's going to be, we've had two in commodities so far. 
meaning we've had lumber and, and, and ags. I think that you can keep your eyes open. I think there's going to be more of those. Uh, I think that, you know, I could easily see copper doing that. I could easily see, you know, gasoline or crude oil or, or just something you don't expect just taking off and doing that. And I think that people should be aware of the, those opportunities out there. Got it. Got it. And, you know, you being sort of an inflation bull, are you also bullish on gold and other commodities? And I mean, you mentioned a couple of commodities when talking about rolling bubbles. So I'm just curious. So gold is kind of a tough one because a lot of people have been disappointed by gold. Um, I personally think gold has suffered because um, of the bits in the sky. I get in trouble for calling it that, but the Bitcoin. And I also get in trouble for calling it the Bitcoin. Sorry. <laughs> the young people always say like, oh, this old dude that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin. Uh, regardless of what you feel about Bitcoin, I have no doubt that money that would have usually gone to gold ended up in Bitcoin. And gold has suffered at the margin because of Bitcoin. I think eventually that that won't matter as much, but when people are, are disappointed in the last six months of gold, I'm always like, yeah, I get it. A lot of the other things have been ripping and gold hasn't gone up. Uh, but if you think about it, what are we on gold? We're 1800. We're not yeah. that far off the highs. It's not that big a deal. Markets pause. There's different markets at different times you know, have, have uh, are hot. I think gold's headed a lot higher. And I think that the real driver of gold will be central banks. And one of the reasons that I think all, another reason gold has suffered this year is because if you look at like the central bank of Russia, you know, in the, in 2019, they were buying gobs of the stuff and 2020 COVID happened and they're not buying as much. I think at the end of the day though, the, the, the central banks are going to come for the gold. And I think it's, I still think it's a good trade to own. Like financial repression is, is here to stay, meaning that they're going to keep interest rates below the rate of inflation. And I think that gold eventually will have its time in its sun and it'll go higher. Right. And when you say, you know, you're an inflation bull, so are you sort of expecting, you know, say 10 to 20% inflation like the 1970s? Oh, or, uh... Well, yeah. So no, I'm not like, I'm not like the crypto fanatics that, that think that the hyperinflation is coming and that we're going to get this massive debasing of the U S dollar. Uh, but I do think that, that it's coming and it's going to be higher than, than, than the market expects. So I do believe that if you think about like 5% inflation for a decade does a lot to get rid of debts and like, and that's ultimately why they're going to do it. They have it where, we have all these debts and we're going to want to inflate them away. And it, you know, a nice steady 5% for 10 years does a lot. Now the critics will say, once you get five, it's easy to get 10 and it's easy to get 20. I, I think maybe we get a spike to 10. I, but I'd be, I'm not like, I'd be shocked if we got to double digits, I'd be shocked, especially short to run. But I do think that we're going to get consistent, you know, much higher numbers than we've been experiencing. And, and that's going to be a shock. I don't think you need to get to those crazy numbers to have big ramifications to people's portfolios and to have different things occur. So in terms of putting numbers on it, no, I'm probably, I don't think we ever get, you know, double digits, but I do think that we have periods that, that are five plus that make the market scared. And, you know, people usually, and, you know, you made, you made the point about crypto, and a lot of people tend to call crypto uh, or, uh, you know, at least Bitcoin digital gold. And, uh, yeah. and then, you know, they tend to point to other, you know, parts of the cryptocurrency, uh, you know, asset class like Dogecoin or something. And then they say that crypto is in a bubble. So what are, what are your views on crypto? Where do you stand? Oh. We have Does to get tell you to ask me that. Like I, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I have too much fun staying poor to, to answer that question. I'll just skip it. <laughs> Good luck to all the crypto people out there is all I can say. Got it. I hope it all works for you. Got it. 
<laughs> and do you think that we're going to see shifts in policy, like, you know, towards, say, you know, modern monetary theory, MMT, which has been, you know, a, a subject of a lot of debate on Twitter? Yeah. So, so first of all, MMT, uh, I've been, uh, uh, I've been, MMT kind of sympathetic for some time. And the reason that I've been MMT sympathetic is that if you actually take the time to go learn about what it is, you'll realize that a lot of it is based upon how the actual economy works and the plumbing behind the system. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I'm an economics major, although as I told you, I didn't do very, like I wasn't working very hard at school, but I was too busy working. But I'm an economics major and up until MMT, before that, if you told me that I would have spent any time at all listening to a professor talk, I would have told you you were insane. Because I thought they were the most, economics, uh, it's a dismal science. I thought it was useless. I thought they would get up there and tell you things that were almost always wrong. It, it offered no value as a trader. All the, their theories were just, I thought it was complete bullshit. And, and the reason I thought that was because it didn't work. And they didn't explain things and they didn't understand things. Then MMT came along and, and I'll, MMT, you know, I started to hear about it and I was like, I better learn about it. Cause like, I, I, if something's getting some traction, like I don't know and understand it, I, I feel like an idiot. So I kind of reached out and I asked some people and they sent me to, you know, the, the big ones. They sent me to Stephanie Kelton. They sent me to Bill Mitchell and they sent me to Randall Ray. And I went and I listened to a, a speech and, or a, a it wasn't a speech, maybe it was a class. And I was like, this has got to be wrong. Like this, like, this is just like all the things they were saying was just like, it seems so wrong. And then I was like, okay, well then explain to, like I thought to myself, well, I'm going to try to prove them wrong. Like I, I, I know they're wrong, so I got to prove it. So, but I, you know, the more I learned about it, the more I was like, holy shit, like, you know, it's, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I was going through things and I, and I was like trying to understand like how it all worked. And so when people ask me, you know, are we headed towards MMT? I always say to them, listen, we already have become much more MMT in that we are starting to understand how the economy works. And people think that MMT is like something you do. No, MMT is a framework for understanding how a real economy like works. And one of the problems is that we used to be on a gold system. And all of our economics books were based upon this gold-backed, you know, monetary system. And then when Nixon went off the gold standard in 71, we didn't bother rewriting any of the books. So we have all these systems that are based upon a gold-backed system, you know, you know, regime. And then meanwhile, we're running on a fiat-based system. So it's completely different. And so I say to, you know, when people ask me, are we going to do it? I say, well, we already are using it to understand how the system works. And when a lot of people associate MMT with like spending and deficits Printing. and all these things. And the reality is that MMT isn't those things. MMT explains how you go about how an economy works. And then once you understand how an economy actually works, society has a choice about what they want to do in terms of how you do it. So there's, there's kind of the descriptive part of MMT, meaning this is how the economy works. This is how it really functions. And then there's the prescriptive part in terms of once we understand that, this is what we want to do about it. Too often people, you know, don't understand the difference and they think that, that MMT is the prescriptive part. And if you look at some of the most famous kind of bond uh, strategists out there, some of these guys that you know get all sorts of attention, you'll realize that a lot of their basis for how the economy works is, is very much consistent with MMT. And you might not like it, and that might make you feel like, oh no, I hate this MMT, but the reality is that when you go look at how actually the economy works, it makes a lot more sense. Like, I'll give you just kind of the classic one, quantitative easing. Let's just go through the process of quantitative easing and we'll think about it from how a traditional person thinks about quantitative easing and then we'll think about how as an mmt -er thinks about it. So you're JP Morgan. JP Morgan gets a call from the Federal Reserve and says, sell me a billion dollars of, of, you know, we want to buy a billion dollars of bonds, okay? 
So JP Morgan sells them this billion dollars of bonds and all of a sudden, you know, JP Morgan delivers the bonds to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve gives them, you know, what in essence is cash, but it's, you know, bank reserves. Now, the traditional economist or the traditional market, you know, person will say, okay, that billion dollars is into the system and that billion dollars is going to get lent out and then there's going to be a multiplier effect and then it's going to take off and we're going to have a hyperinflation because of this billion dollars. Well, the MMT people will look at this and say, listen, you know, the JP Morgan has a billion dollars more reserves in their system, but does that really make them any more likely to make a loan? Like, does, is that what was holding them back from making loans? Or is it really more a function, are, aren't loans a function of how much demand there is? what the JP Morgan's actual balance sheet or, or capital position looks like, meaning that like they could have a billion dollars more reserves, but if their balance sheet is very tight and that they don't have a lot of equity cushion and they've already lent it out, they're not going to lend that money out. So when you realize it and you start to think about it, you're like, oh yeah, that makes actually no, makes no sense. Why does the Federal Reserve buying a billion dollars mean that, that JP Morgan is going to go out and make a billion dollars of loans? And it's not. And so a lot of these things that we've taken kind of just like, this is how it works. And in the old days, when you were reserve constrained, when you were a bank that was reserve constrained, generally you would go out and lend those monies out when you got them. So you would do it. But in this day and age, that's not how it works in the real world. Right. And it gets kind of tiresome to be around people that are calling for all these things to happen when they don't actually take the time to think about, you know, how What's it going works, on you know, in terms of following the money. And listen, in 2008, there was, you know, Ben Bernanke came and they went and they created this, you know, they did quantitative easing one and then two and three and with a twist in there. And somewhere along the way there, there's a whole bunch of really smart, you know, pun, smart pundits that said, we're going to write an open letter to Ben Bernanke. I was going to create all this inflation. Well, the reality is he didn't create all this inflation. Now, you might not like the quantitative easing, and you might think it caused asset inflation, and I completely get that. I'm not going to argue that and defend that. But the, but the point is, what they thought was going to happen didn't happen. Right. And when I think why I am so attracted to MMT was that by understanding how an actual economy works in a modern world with an, under a modern fiat system, it becomes much more able to predict and make a kind of forecast. So here's another example. In Once COVID hit, there was all sorts of people that were bearish. And I remember I got somewhat um, less bearish and I actually got bullish and it was, my timing wasn't bad. And I got on, I got on this podcast, a very famous podcast. And I said that, you know, I think you should, I think you should buy it. I think you're going to be surprised about how the government can fill the hole, meaning like fill the, the economic hole that's there. Well, the shit that I got, Tree, I can't tell you, like I got <laughs> the meanest, the meanest things about how I didn't understand stuff and I got it all. And, you know, it just, it, it kind of makes me laugh because we're now at a stage where everyone just takes it for granted that they think, oh yeah, it's so obvious that was gonna happen. And I was like, no, lots of people thought that the government couldn't save the system and I've always said the government can fill the hole if there's a political need or will. Yeah. And I think that, that the MMTers would have said that. And so the reality is that um, the world has woken up to that. Now, herein lies the problem with me. The hard money guys don't like me because I'm MMT uh, sympathetic. The MMT guys don't like me because they all say that they're going to be able to control inflation. They all say, no way, we're going to be able to control and stuff like that. And I'm not trying to say that we're going to have hyperinflation like these other folks are saying, but I'm thinking it's going to be harder than the MMT years believe in controlling inflation. Mm -hmm. And then you need to adjust your portfolios based upon that. The reality is that we're human beings. Human beings always take things to extremes. All you have to do is look at our monetary policy and realize that ECB has rates at minus 50 basis points to realize that we take things to extremes. We're going to take this, you know, MMT or fiscal dominance is like, you know, as my friend Lynn Alden has, has, has coined it, we're going to take fiscal dominance to an extreme as well. And, and instead of worrying about what's right, and this is, this is my other pet peeve that I always tell street everyone, I tell everyone, is that don't worry about what's right. Don't worry about what should be. 
worry about what will be done. And if you do that, you'll realize there's no sense sitting around and arguing on Twitter about what the proper course of monetary policy is. You're much better off just trying to figure out what the pro- what what will be done as opposed to what should be done. Got it. And you know, one of the interesting points that Warren Mosler actually makes in his book, Soft Currency Economics, is as you said, uh, you know, banks lend when they want to lend, and then they borrow the reserves in the funding market. You know when they need to meet the regular, uh, you know, when they need to meet regulation during, you know, the accounting yep. cycle, right? Yep. And, and, you know, I think that's sort of what the key mistake in most people's belief is. And now I wanted to sort of make the shift and talk about you as an intraday trader, which is also something you do. So, you know, how do you actually go about finding trades as, you know, an intraday trader as opposed to more long-term? Oh, micro? like, you know, like a trade. A trader that I heard, you know, like whipping it around. So um, that is um, a different skill set. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm probably not as good at that. Um, I trade with a bunch of guys, and there's they're all great, and there's one of them is just outstanding. And um, in terms of finding ideas, you should figure out what your edge is. Everyone everyone has different personalities. Everyone will have different things that they feel more comfortable with. And then it's a question of instilling the right discipline. I've always said that making money is the easy part, not losing it is the hard part. And if you go look at most people's P and L's, you'll see that it's like this, 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 and then this, right? And it's like, it's like everyone's, it's like the, the trading is no different. Everyone's the same and everyone suffers from that. And so the discipline to make sure that you don't do this and instead of just kind of like this is really what you need. And if there was one thing that I would tell people in terms of like day trading, it's give yourself hard limits and then walk away. So like you're saying like, whatever your number is, you know, it might be 500 bucks, it might be 5,000 bucks, it might be 50,000 bucks, but you should have your like line in the sand if I hit this, I'm walking away. And the reason you need this is because let's assume your limit is 5,000 bucks. Yeah, there's, there might be times that you go down 5,000 bucks and then you finished up on the day. You make it back, okay? But I can tell you with surety <laughs> that you will have a lot more days that your five turns into minus 20 or whatever the numbers are, like whatever your numbers are, just what I'm saying is multiples of that. So one of the things that you like, we can talk about like how you can find strategies and opportunities, but I don't think that's as important. I don't think that's like, I think there's a million people out there that are coming up with those ideas and doing things and you just figure out what's right for you. I wouldn't worry about like, if I was teaching someone and if I was like, let's say my son wanted to get into day trading, I would be like, you're going to figure out how to make money. I'm not worried about that part. I'm worried about you losing money. And what you have to make sure is that you don't have debilitating losses that take you out of the game. You have to make sure that you're always, you know, managing risk. Some, yeah. And, and that, that to me is so, so much more important than the making. The making you'll figure out. Like there's like, as I say, like you'll eventually make it and you'll figure it out. That's not, that's not hard. And there's a million different strategies out there. At the end of the day, I'll just kind of go through them. You're, you're generally, um, as a day trader, most day traders are momentum surfers, meaning that they're looking for stocks that are moving and they're going with it. And the basic thought process behind that is that when, when you get a large move, generally it's from news and generally that news isn't built in instantly. And, and so the thought being that if it moves outside, you know, usually you, you can quantitate it. Like you can say, if you get a standard deviation move, that's this, chances are that it's going to get, it's going to be more because it means there's something new system into the system. So the majority of day traders that I've found that are good end up being momentum surfers. There are the occasional ones that are like the knife catchers. They're like basically looking for, you know, something that's moved too far, too fast. I would say that the knife catchers have had a really difficult time over the last um, 
basically all COVID, but especially recently, because the reality is the momentum was just being huge. Uh, it's been, it, it's, the, other, the other piece of advice I give you is that you need to adapt. And so in the old days, when somebody was on CNBC and some stock would spike, so let's say we're trading, let's just say Tesla. Tesla comes on, Tesla, there's an analyst that comes on, Tesla's trading 700 bucks, mm -hmm. Tesla rallies 10 bucks on this analyst saying it's a buy, okay? There's really no new information, right? Like, the, like let's face it, it's just some guy saying he likes it, okay? In the old days, you'd sell that, meaning that you get a spike, they've moved it outside the kind of where, what it's worth, eventually the buying subsides and we go back down. This past kind of COVID period, it's been shocking because stuff that you would think would be built into the market, meaning stuff that you would think that it would, the market would figure out and quickly adapt to, kept rallying, kept going. Like some guy get on TV and like he wouldn't say anything new about Tesla. The thing would rally 10 bucks and then would go another 50. And it was kind of shocking and it was kind of like, you, we we had a, we were laughing and like the guys I trade with they had a saying they said you can't you can't fight stupid right now, and what you need to realize is, as a trader is that there's different environments, and you need to adapt to those different environments. And if you sat there and you know you used old old environment rules in this past few months, then it's been brutal. And just like now, tech is for sale and everything's struggling and all the SPACs that used to be hot, now all of a sudden you buy these things and they just crumble in your, in your, in your, in your, in your hands, right? Yep. So the reality is that as a trader, you need, to rec you need to recognize that, you need to start to figure it out, and you need to have discipline. And the other piece of advice to give to everyone is write a journal, write a journal, write what you did right, write what you did wrong, and be brutal about it and go through it and be honest, like force yourself to deal with your mistakes, force yourself to kind of think about what you're doing right and wrong. Awesome. Got it. But that, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Kevin. It was awesome. My pleasure. You. It's nice to meet you, buddy. Thank you.